أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight we have gathered also to celebrate the birth and the wilad of our second holy Imam, Al Imam Al Hassan Al Mushtaba, alayhi afdalu salati wa salam. And I find the best way to celebrate and bring joy on this day is to talk about those things which were dear to the second Imam. And amongst the things that was very dear to the second Imam is the Quran itself. Inshallah, today I'd like to talk about how to have a meaningful engagement with the Qur'an with examples from the life of the second Imam. One of the roles of the Qur'an in any society is to bring about liberation and growth in that society. So God says that we have sent this Qur'an. It commands people towards good and prevents them from committing evil. And then God says, وَيَضَعُوا عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ it removes those shackles that impede their growth, their social, their spiritual, and their intellectual growth. When you look at Arabia before the advent of Islam, it was a backward civilization. There was no education in Arabia at that time. There were no schools, there were no books, there were no teachers. In fact, any science that they had was superstition. Their astronomy was superstitious. Their medicine was superstitious as well. The number of people that could read and write were more than the fingers on our hands. And the only thing that they did study was poetry, lineology, because of the pride that they had in their ancestry and their history because of the pride that they had in their clans and their tribes. You also find that there was no concept of justice and morals. In fact, there were no courts that were set up in Arabia. It was a time when the strong oppressed the weak. It was a time when the majority were able to ignore the minority. In fact, you, you find that it was a time in Arabia that they were steeped into superstition. In fact, if you lived in Arabia at that time, not only were there no schools, but you also find that the people of Arabia themselves had no confidence either. They lived in a, they lived in a place that even though they were surrounded by three superpowers of the time, they were surrounded by the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and the Yemeni civilization. They had nothing of value for the people of Rome or the people of Persia or the Yemenis to come and to conquer them. That was the people of Arabia at that time. It was a time when women did not have their rights. When a man gave, gave birth to a daughter, his face turned into despair. He became sad and sometimes he even buried his daughter alive. It was a time when women had no autonomy of their own. In fact, it is said when a man died, his inheritance included his wealth, his property, his cattle, and also included his women as well. The eldest child in the family would inherit the wives of his father at that time. That is how backward Arabia was before the coming of Islam. 
and after the coming of the Prophet of Allah. In 23 years, the Prophet of Allah turned this community around. You find very soon in Arabia, so much courage is developed amongst the people that on one hand they went 12 or 14 years after the passing away of the Prophet of Allah, they had conquered Persia and had reached the boundaries of China. In fact, the first mosque to be established in China was established by Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, who was a Sahabi of the Prophet of Allah. In time, they would conquer northern Africa and go all the way to southern Spain, which was at that time called Andalusia. Universities started to appear. Books were written. Thinkers appeared on the scene, the likes of which humanity has not seen or had not seen up until that time. They established libraries. A society that was that backward established libraries. One of the most important libraries was the Baytul Hikmah that was later destroyed by the Mongols. By the year 750, they had learned how to make paper when they had conquered some of the Chinese prisoners. And from that point forward, they published and distributed books in abundance. You find by that same year, 750, they were involved in so many discoveries and making technology that in the year 750, they sent the first clock to France. The Muslim Khalif sent a clock to Charlemagne of France when Parisians did not even know what a clock was supposed to do. Morality and justice appeared on the scene. Courts were now established to give the weak their rights. In fact, you find that when you go to the city of Kufa and you go to the Masjid of Kufa, you will find a place over there known as Dakkatul Qada, where you recite a two rak'ah prayer. That was known as the podium of justice, where our first Imam, Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi afdalus salati was salam. would sit and administer justice amongst the people. You find that justice as a thought becomes important even if it was not always implemented in that society. Where you find a man like the first Imam says that even if I was given whatever is under the skies and whatever you find in the lands so that I may take away a part of a grain that is in the mouth of a, an ant, I would not be willing to do that. That was the concept of justice. Human rights appeared on the scene. That people have rights and minorities have rights and these rights have to be protected within the law. In fact, the purpose of government, the reason why we establish government sometimes, we establish government is also to protect the rights of people. 12 years after the Prophet had passed away, the Muslims went and conquered Jerusalem and they put a siege on Jerusalem. And the governor of Jerusalem at that time was a Christian. And when they had put a siege on Jerusalem, they worked out an agreement with the governor. And the governor said, as long as you agree to these clauses, we don't have to have a bloody battle to take over Jerusalem, and I will personally hand over the keys to you. One of the clauses that they had put in there is that when the Muslims come and rule over Jerusalem, they would not allow the Jewish people to enter the city of Jerusalem, to settle themselves over there, nor to do business over there. It was very easy for the Muslims at that time to sign the treaty and to accept these conditions. But the Muslims rejected it because they said the Prophet of Allah has not allowed us to do this. This is how Arabia had changed only a few decades after the coming of the Holy Prophet. And this transformation had primarily come about because of the Qur'an. It was a time when Muslims engaged in a meaningful relationship with the Qur'an. It transformed their lives, it transformed their societies. But you find today, Muslims prefer to have a mysterious relationship with the Qur'an over having a meaningful relationship with the Qur'an. The scope of our benefit from the Qur'an today is limited. When a person passes away, we shall open the Qur'an to recite Qur'an for him. When a person is sick, we will ask people to recite the Qur'an for him 
because mysteriously he will become well. And it is good for us to recite the Quran when somebody is sick, when somebody has passed away. But the question we're asking today, is that the scope and the limitation of our benefit that we are going to take away from the Quran? When somebody is getting married and the bride is leaving the house, she has to leave under the shade of the Quran, even though sometimes the rules and laws of the Quran are being broken at that time. When somebody buys a new house, then the first thing they want to take into that new house is a copy of the Quran, because if it is there, then mysteriously it will bring barakah into the house. And there is no doubt, it does bring barakah in the house. When a person wants to make decisions, they would prefer to make decisions with the pages of the Quran over the very important principles of the Quran itself. Today, when a Muslim wants to develop a philosophy for his life, a philosophy by which he is going to live his life, he would prefer to listen to a TED talk on YouTube for 10 minutes, which is sometimes more entertaining than substantial, more superficial than having any actual content, than to look in his own home at a copy of the Qur'an. We prefer to have a mysterious relationship with the Qur'an over a meaningful relationship with the Qur'an. You find that the Ahlul Bayt salam always took practical guidance from the Qur'an. The second holy Imam, Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba alayhi salam One day somebody came to him and said, Yabna Rasulullah, I am a farmer. There isn't enough rain in the land. What should I do? And the Imam said to him, Seek forgiveness from Allah. Somebody else came to him, Yabna Rasulullah, I do not have children. What should I do? The Imam said, Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God will grant you what you want. A third person came after a while. And he said, Yabna Rasulullah, I am poor. What can I do so that God would bless me? And the Imam said, Seek forgiveness, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you from that. One of his companions who was sitting with the Imam, he said, Yabna Rasulullah, I do not understand. Three people came to you with three different problems, and you gave them the same advice. In other words, if that is what your role is, then even I can fulfill that role. Where do you get this advice from? And the Imam said, this is the advice that we get from the Qur'an. For the Almighty says in the Qur'an, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا The Prophet, he said to his community, Seek forgiveness from God, for you shall find your Lord to be forgiving. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He will make the water descend from the sky in abundance. وَيُمْدِدُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And he will aid you with children and he will aid you with wealth as well. So in the rest of tonight's discussion, we would like to see how we can take benefit from the Qur'an in our daily lives. And we shall look at that by answering two questions. The first question, is it possible for us as human beings to reflect upon the Qur'an and take away a meaningful understanding from the Qur'an and secondly, if that is possible, then what are some practical methods that we can implement in our lives so that we can take benefit from the teachings of the Qur'an? We come to the first question. Sometimes it is said that the Qur'an is an enigma. It is a code. And nobody can understand the Qur'an except for the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. And therefore, as human beings, we cannot take any meaning from the Qur'an. This used to be a thought that existed in Shia history. It was part of the Akhbari thought. However, our scholars today say that as human beings, even if we are not ma'asum, we have to be able to take away a rudimentary understanding from the Qur'an. And their argument is rather very simple. They say that every prophet must come with a miracle because we would not accept him unless he came with a miracle. And miracles are important because we know that God would never give a miracle 
to somebody who's not a prophet. Because if that person was able to perform miracles, then he would misguide people. And then the next time when a prophet came, one sent by God with miracles, people would not know whether to trust him or not to trust him. Then sending that prophet would be in vain, and God does not do those things which are in vain. One. Number two. They also say that the miracles of the prophets are appropriate to their time and age. Prophet Musa came with the miracle of the staff. He came with the miracle which was like magic because magic held authority and sway amongst the people of Egypt. Prophet Isa came with a miracle that was like healing and medicine because that held sway amongst the people of his time. He gave life to the dead. They, they were bewildered by it. He gave sight to the blind. He cured those who had leprosy. And you find that even today, we're not easily able to cure people with leprosy. After many surgeries, and cosmetic surgeries, and medicine, and physiotherapy, that person still does not go back to the same state that he was. And yet Prophet Isa would just pass his hand over that person, and that person would be cured. The people were bewildered by it. And the miracle of the Holy Prophet was the Qur'an. This is because the people of Arabia were the best of poets. And this is because from that day until today, that which holds sway over human being are ideas. People are amazed and inspired by ideas. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the miracle of the Qur'an. And the Prophet of Allah presented this miracle to the people. And they read the Qur'an. And they understood the Qur'an. And the Qur'an challenged them. If you're able to bring even one verse like the verse of the Qur'an, or one chapter like the chapter of the Qur'an, do so. How could they have done that if they could not even have a rudimentary understanding of the Qur'an? Today, how can I be bewildered by the Qur'an if I cannot have a basic understanding of the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an? The argument is very simple. For me to accept the Prophet as a Prophet, he needs to bring a miracle. His miracle is the Qur'an. For me to be able to accept the Qur'an as a miracle, I have to have a basic understanding of it. Now this does not mean that we do not need the Ahlul Bayt. We need the Ahlul Bayt to teach us the interpretation. We need the Ahlul Bayt to teach us how to interpret the Qur'an at a deeper level. And you find that the Ahlul Bayt did that. They taught us how to interpret the Qur'an through the Qur'an itself. And this is a tool that our scholars use today. A man once came during the time of the second Imam. He had read a verse in the Qur'an, وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ The one who witnesses and that which is witnessed. He went to Ibn Abbas, who was a scholar of his time, and said, what is this referring to? And Ibn Abbas said to him, this is referring to the day of Friday and the day of Arafah. He went to Abdullah ibn Umar and asked him, what does this verse refer to? And Abdullah ibn Umar said to him, it refers to the day of Friday and it also refers to the day of Hajj. Now you're getting the idea. Whatever is the answer, it is referring to particular days. Now he comes to the second imam and says, Yabna Rasulillah, what does shahid mean? What does mashhud mean? The imam says to him, shahid means the prophet of Allah. Mashhud means the day of judgment. He says, I do not understand. Your answer is very different from those who came before you. The imam said to him, my answer is the answer of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran to the Holy Prophet, Inna arusalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. O Prophet of God, we have sent you as a witness. And as for mashhud, there is another verse in the Quran. Yawmum majmu'un lahu nas wa thalika yawmum mashhud. The day of judgment is the day where things will be witnessed. So the Ahlul Bayt, they teach us how to interpret the Quran. But here is the fundamental premise that we have to accept today. The Qur'an takes on meaning in every society. It takes on new light in every society. 
the Ahlul Bayt have to teach us how to interpret the Quran to overcome the challenges that we're going to be facing in our societies. In a beautiful tradition, they say that this Quran is alive, it never dies. Every ayah, ayah of the Quran is alive, it never dies. For if a verse of the Quran were to become irrelevant because it was revealed for one particular community and not for any other community, then you would find that the whole Quran will die. However, the Quran is alive, meaning it has new meaning in every day and age. That is not just for the scholars of the faith. For I and you, in our personal lives and circumstances, we have to be able to give meaning to the Qur'an and make it relevant to our challenges, make it relevant to our problems as well. It is not just a text of history, it's a very organic text. Now if we have accepted that, for the rest of tonight's lecture, let me share with you two practical ways for how we can benefit, or three practical ways for how we can benefit from the Qur'an if you recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. First, allow the Qur'an to mold your character and lift your spirit. We think of the Qur'an as a teacher. The Qur'an is in fact a mentor. The Qur'an is a trainer. It molds the hearts and souls of people over a period of time. One of the things that we do every day, inshallah, is to recite the Qur'an. And brothers ask, how should we recite the Qur'an? And how much of the Qur'an should I recite? Some of the ahadith, they tell us, recite 50 verses of the Qur'an. Some of the ahadith tell us, recite 100 verses of the Qur'an. Sometimes after a lecture, we become so passionate, we become, we have a lot of passion. And so we decide that from now on, I am going to read three to four pages of the Qur'an every day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Recite that much of the Qur'an that is easy for you to recite. Do you know what that means? That means recite that much that you know if I recite this much, I'll be able to recite it for the next six months. I'll be able to recite it for the next year. Maybe I may be able to recite three to four pages for the first week after the month of Ramadan. Maybe I can do that for the first month after the month of Ramadan. But can I continue with it? Perhaps not. Maybe the only amount that I can recite is half a page. So the hadith tells us, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Do you know which deed is most beloved to God? Which is the greatest of deeds in the eyes of God? مَا دَا وَمَا عَلَيْهِ الْعَبْدِ وَإِنْ Is that deed that you can perform consistently even if it is a little bit? If all you can do after the salat is do tasbih of Lady Fatima, that is sufficient, but do it every day. Do it five times in a day, it will have an impact on your heart. Now, should we also recite the translation? Should we only recite the translation? I say we should recite the Arabic and then glance through the translation. After you've recited half a page, open up the translation and generally look at the meaning of what you have recited on that day. Should I also look at the tafsir of the Quran every day? No, you don't have to do that. You may have a separate program for looking at tafsir, but ask yourself, if I made it incumbent upon myself to look at the tafsir every day, can I continue with this program for the next six months? Maybe I cannot do that. Now you do that sometimes. And you come back to the speaker and say, Mawlana, I tried to do what you did, but I didn't feel anything. Yesterday I recited the Qur'an the way you told me to recite the Qur'an. I thought that I would feel like I am up in the clouds, and I didn't feel anything. I could still hear the noises in the street. I could still hear the children crying. And sometimes I felt miserable as well. I came to the masjid. You promised me my spirituality would turn around. And here I am at the masjid and I don't feel any better. Okay? This is because we live in a culture of instant gratification. We want results. 
and we want them now. And we take that culture and we impose it upon our spirituality as well. The Qur'an does not work in that manner. It molds our character over time. Allow the simple messages of the Qur'an to gently tap at your soul. Just the way those droplets of water were tapping on the stone basins. And over time, look at yourself three months down the road. Huh? Look at yourself six months down the road. And then ask yourself, is my character today different from the way it was three months ago? Certainly you will find it. You will find that your character is now trying, is now slowly becoming like the character of the Quran. Your spirituality is slowly getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second way of engaging with the Quran is to reflect upon the verses of the Quran. And this is where we face a dilemma. Because on one hand, we are told to reflect upon the verses of the Qur'an. And on the other hand, we're told not to interpret the verses of the Qur'an for ourselves. A person who does not have expertise should not be interpreting the verses of the Qur'an. مَنْ فَسَّرَ الْقُرْآنَ بِرَأْيِهِ فَقَدْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ Whoever interprets the Qur'an in accordance to his own personal opinion, then that person has fabricated a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on one hand, you're told to be precautious. On the other hand, now you're being told, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا What is wrong with them? Why do they not reflect upon the verses of the Qur'an? Or are there seals that have been placed on their hearts? The Qur'an was speaking to the people of Arabia. The Bedouins who lived in the desert, the Bedouins who had not heard any lectures from the member, the Bedouins who had not gone to madrasa, the Bedouins who had not seen one day of school, and talking to them, the Quran says, Afala yatadabbaruna al Quran. What is wrong with you? Why do you not reflect upon the Quran? So, what is the difference between tafsir and tadabbur? I want to look at a number of options as we continue today. Some people have said that tafsir is meant for the scholars and tadabbur is meant for everyone. But that still does not answer the question. Why is tafsir only meant for the scholars and tadabbur for everyone? Some have said that tafsir engages the mind and tadabbur engages the heart. In tadabbur you ask, what are the messages there for me? For example, in the khutbah of Hammam, the first Imam tells his companion, the muttaqeen are those, when they come across the verses of the Qur'an that talk about paradise, their hearts yearn for paradise. When they come across those verses that talk about hellfire, their hearts become fearful of the fire of hell. Some have said that tafsir is when you look at what that verse means for others, Whilst tadabbur is what, when you look at that verse and see what it means for you. But I want to share with you a very simple idea. And I think this can help us to do tadabbur over the Qur'an. It gives us a mechanism. Okay? When you walk into a class sometimes, you will notice that you're taught two things in a class. First, you're taught theory. And then you're taught application. For example, you walk into a class of physics, you might be taught the theory of relativity, and then you'll be told there's an application to this theory. GPSs, for example, today would not work if we did not understand Einstein's special theory for relativity. This is because the satellites orbiting in the sky are moving at a very fast speed and their clocks work differently from the clocks that we have on earth. So you have got theory and you have got application. Sometimes you struggle with the theory. You go to the teacher and ask clarification on the theory. Sometimes you struggle on the application and you struggle with it yourself. Okay. In the same way that you have theory and application, you also have verses of the Quran and the application of those verses. When the verses are not clear for you, one needs to go for tafsir. When the verse has become clear for you, 
and you want to see the application, one has to do tadabbur. If that is clear, let's look at an example of this. If you recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We're requested to move a couple of cars which are blocking the entrance where there is a mayyid and their families need the car to be moved. The uh, license plates are T222 DET and T555 DDJ. T222 DET and T555 DDJ. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. God says in the Quran, من ذا الذي يقرض الله قرضا حسنا فيضاعف له أضعافا كثيرة Who is willing to give a goodly loan to God so that God may increase it for him many fold. We generally use this verse of the Quran when you want to convince somebody to give a قرضة حسنا. Okay? However, when you refer to the tafsir of this Quran you come to realize it's not talking about qarda hasana it's actually talking about sadaqa it says that when you give sadaqa you may think that you have given that money away rather think of it as a loan that you have given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you may not have any expectations from it rather remind yourself it will return back to you when you are helping a person in need you look at that person and all you can see is that person's face. However, in the ahadith we're told, when you give money to somebody in need, it first goes into the hands of God, even before it goes into the hands of that person. Now that comes from this verse of the Quran. If the meaning of the verse is clear, one night I ought to sit with myself and ask myself, what is my approach at giving sadaqah? One of the most precious things that we have in our life is our time. Sometimes you find it's easier for me to donate to the community my money than to give my time to the community. But how can a community function if it wasn't because of the volunteers, if it wasn't because of the teachers, if it wasn't because of the administrators? So sometimes I have to sit back to myself and ask myself, when the community comes and asks me to volunteer, do I ask myself, why should I volunteer to this community? What has it given to me? Or do I think to myself, why should I give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I ask myself, why do they always ask me? And why do they not ask somebody else? Do I ask myself, how much are they going to be asking me? Or do I say to myself, I wish they would ask me so that I could give something in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith we're told that when a person has a need from you, it is one of the greatest blessings of God upon you. Therefore, do not turn the blessings of God away. This is reflection upon the verses of the Qur'an. The third manner of engagement with the Qur'an, and inshallah we end the discussion for tonight. As we reflect upon the Qur'an, let us also reflect the Qur'an in our character. When you look at the life of the Ahlul Bayt, they used to reflect the Qur'an in that character. The Qur'an is a book very different from other books. It's not like a novel that you read. It's not like a textbook that you pick up. You pick up a novel at night, you read it. You can forget about it for a whole week and pick it up the week later. You pick up a textbook, you read it, you benefit from it. You can forget about it for a whole month, pick it up after one month, and still benefit from it. The Qur'an is very different. The Qur'an is a very organic book. The more you interact with the Qur'an, the more you benefit from it. As I mentioned to you, when somebody asked one of our scholars, what is the best path to spirituality? Teach me everything that I need to know. The scholar said to him, you just need to act upon those things that you know and God will teach you those things that you need to know. Now this is a principle in the Qur'an. 
Ittaqullah. Be God wary. Yu'allimkumullah. God will teach you what you need to know. Now we come to a practical example from the life of the second Imam. It is said that one day the second Imam was seated in his house and he had a slave maid. And by the way, our Imams did have slave maids. They bought them, they brought them in the house, they gave dignity to them, they educated them, they trained them, and when they were ready to come back into society, the Imams freed them in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they could enter society with dignity. The Imam had a slave maid. One day she entered and she said salamun alaykum to the Imam and gave him a bouquet of flowers out of her love for the Imam. The Imam seated there, he took that, he said alaykum as salam and you are free in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Sahabi seated next to the Imam he said, Yabna Rasulillah, a bouquet of flowers is not worth the price of a slave. It is as if somebody came today to you and gave you some flowers, and in return you say to him, you can take my car, I have given it to you as a gift. It is not like that. The Imam said to him that this is what we learn from the Quran. You have all, a quote, you have all come across a verse where God says, Ida huyyaytum bitahiyyatin Whenever you are greeted with a greeting, then respond with a greeting that is better or at least something that is equivalent. Now, for most of us what this means is if somebody tells you salamun alaykum, you respond with alaykum as salam to the least. If somebody tells you salamun alaykum wa rahmatullah, you respond with wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah to the least. The Imam says, she said salamun alaykum, I said, alaykum as -salam. She greeted me with a bouquet of flowers. I had nothing else to give at that time. So I freed her in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we reflect upon the Qur'an, let us also try to reflect the Qur'an in our lives and in our character as well. So today I've shared with you three simple ways for engaging with the Qur'an. Firstly, I have said, let us read the Qur'an with attentiveness. And let us do that every day. Secondly, I said, let us reflect upon the verses of the Qur'an after those verses have become clear for us. And thirdly, I said, let us take some simple verses of the Qur'an and reflect them in our character so that God may raise our character and lift our spirituality. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As we end the session this evening by remembering the Imam of our time who makes dua for us as we are in the middle of the month of Ramadan, we pray that he remembers us in his duas and pays special attention to our needs and pays special attention to our issues. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma kulli waliyika al hujjat ibn al hasan صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين